grace, and I'm glad for that explanation of the banner. But I've got news for you. You'll never get rid of the bad attitude as long as Dr. Ruckman is here, amen? <laughs> and it'll never be slick as long as Dr. Ruckman is here, amen? <laughs> Say amen, it won't hurt you. Yeah. I saw some of you almost squeaking amen out the other day. I really did. Some of you just about got excited. I saw some of you women go, amen. I mean, you just about let go. Maybe you will before the meeting's over. It's a joy and a privilege to be here and have this opportunity to preach tonight. I thank the Lord for saving me. I'm glad tonight it's well with my soul. Amen. Yeah. I'm ready to leave. I'm ready to go. Amen. Yeah. I've had all of this sick world that I want to have. I've seen all the heartaches and the tears and the sorrows that I care to see. If I had but one prayer to be answered tonight, it'd be even so come, Lord Jesus. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I've wearied of this life, tired of this life. Many people say that's just the chicken's attitude. That's right, I'm chicken, amen. I know the longer I live, the more chance I have to mess up, and I don't particularly enjoy messing up, amen. But I'm glad to be saved. I'm glad to know the Lord is my Savior, that I belong to Him, and He belongs to me for all eternity. I don't want to ever get too far away from Calvary, and I forget what Jesus' blood has done for you and I. Well, I, I said at a funeral the other day that I had to preach, and I saw some people in there that were afraid to look at the body, looked, uh, just looked out into space because they had no hope whatsoever. I looked in their eyes and saw a Bible word, and that was the word lost. Lost. I mean, you could see it down in their eyes, see it down in the depths of their souls. Lost. No hope and without God in this world. And I sat there at that loved one of mine that died knowing he is in heaven and I'm going to heaven too. And I'll tell you, tears begin to run out of my eyes as I thank the Lord for saving my soul. And I thanked him once again for the time when I was 15 years old and I called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and he saved me. Aren't you glad that you're saved tonight? And I'd rather be saved in any way I know. I've, I've never found any better way to be than to be saved, amen? Nothing. I'm happier now when I'm not happy than when I was happy before, aren't you? Amen. Yeah, I'm happier now when I am not happy when I was happy before, amen? All right, amen. You'll have to get that on tape to understand it, I imagine. Take your Bibles, if you would, and open to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I've enjoyed being here, not just because of the chance to preach, although I always enjoy a chance to preach the Word and to say something from a Savior, but the messages that I've been able to hear and the things that the Lord has done in my heart, I appreciate. I appreciate this church and them having a burden and a desire to have something like this and to make it possible that we could get together and fellowship one with another. The messages have been very good, very good. Uh, nobody could improve. Each one has done what God would have them to do and said. And uh, Each time you hear it, you say, well, it couldn't get any better. And then somebody else preaches something a little bit better and says something this. And it just gets you and cuts you. And one minute you're bleeding, the next minute you're crying. And you're laughing and you're rejoicing. And I'm glad to see God have a chance to move. I'm tired of seeing what man can do. I want to see what God can do, don't you? I want God to be real in my life, real in my preaching, real in my witnessing, real in my home. I don't want just some God who's removed over here. I go pick him up on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and drop him off till Wednesday. I want him every day of my life in everything that I do. And every person that's saved ought to want the same thing. It's kind of hard to describe the preachers. A preacher one time stood, and I think he said it as good as anybody, of an Indian who moved on a reservation. And although he's an Indian, he never, uh, living in modern times, he never adapted the modern methods. He communicated by smoke signals, tribe to tribe. Get out there every morning and send those smoke signals up to a tribe over there. He didn't know it, but he's out west where they're testing the atomic bomb. He woke up one morning and saw this big cloud way off there. He turns to his wife and said, hmm, me wish I'd said that. <laughs> and... When I hear these other preachers preach, that's what I say, mm, me wish I'd said that, amen. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 12, and we begin to read in verse 1. It is not expedient for me doubtless to glory. I come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. Now I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. 
how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such in one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations there was given to me, a foreign in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest, may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecution, in distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Let's go to the Lord in prayer once again and ask his blessing on the word of God. And fathers, we come to you tonight. We thank you, Lord, for what our hearts have already been able to enjoy. We thank you, God, for the songs of Zion that never grow old. The world can put a song in your mouth, but only you can put a song in our heart. And I'm glad for the song of our soul and the time that we've had to worship thee in song in this hour. Lord, I pray that as we come to this time of preaching of thy word, that the Holy Spirit of God would have his will and way in the heart and life of every person that's here. I pray, God, that you'd help me and recall to mind the things that you want me to say. And Holy Spirit, that you'd lead and guide in such a perfect way that if there's anything you want me to say, you'd bring it to mind. And anything that's displeasing to thee, may it not come out of these lips tonight. We want thy will. And, Lord, we want your work to be done in this service tonight. And Lord, I'm conscious of the fact that I can't glorify myself and glorify you at the same time. So cast me aside. Hide me behind the cross of your son, Jesus Christ. Lift up yourself. Lord, may your will and way be done. Lord, if there's some here lost tonight that have never been saved, may tonight be their night of salvation. If there's some here, God, that need some help, those that are saved and know thee, whatever your children's needs are tonight, may you minister to them. And I pray it in Jesus' name, for his sake alone. Amen. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul wrote to the church at Corinth concerning a thing that had happened to him in years gone by. He is caught up to the third heaven. Of course, by closely examining his scripture, you can see that paradise is now in the third heaven. That after the Lord Jesus Christ died and was buried, went to the heart of the earth where paradise was, he emptied that and took those souls, those Old Testament souls, on to heaven with him. And Paul said, I was seeing some things there that were gloriful or glorified or wonderful. And he said, lest I should be exalted above measure, the Lord gave me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. Now, I'm not here tonight to try to tell you what that thorn in the flesh really was. Most of you preachers probably already got your mind made up. I mean, uh, you read all kinds of commentators who are not commentators to me. They're more agitators than anything else. All they do is upset me most of the time when I try to read and find something out from them. But he said, a thorn in the flesh. Some believe as I trouble. Somebody told me that that thorn in Paul's flesh was his wife. Now, I... <laughs> I said I didn't believe that, but at times they do get a little sticky, amen? But he said, unless I should be exalted above measure, it was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. God gave something to Paul that he could not get rid of so that every time he wanted to get exalted or lifted up or thought he was somebody, the Holy Spirit of God would put his finger on that thorn and push it and remind him of how weak and how sinful he really was. God has that for each one of us, a besetting sin, a thing in our life that's like a thorn in the flesh that just the moment we get thinking we're somebody, God will draw the rug out from under us and humble us and bring us down where we need to be. But the Bible says that he besought the Lord thrice. Here's the man who could raise people from the dead. Here's the man who could heal all kinds of sickness and cast out devils. And yet we find that those signs and wonders, as they begin to decline, Paul cannot even heal himself, much less anybody else. Somebody asked me one time, do I believe in divine healing? Yes, I do. 
But I don't believe there's one divine healer, and that's Jesus Christ. I don't believe in these yokums that go around the country throwing up tents, sucking money out of poor, ignorant Christian people, people who have infirmities, people that are crippled, taking advantage of them, I think is one of the lowest, dirtiest tricks that anybody could ever do. I'm here to tell you tonight, if I had the power to heal, I wouldn't waste my time putting up a tent. I wouldn't waste my time building me a church auditorium. I'd come to Rochester and say, take me to the hospital. Take me to the nursing home. Let me heal them. Let me touch them. Let me get them up. Let me tell you, if you had the power to heal, you wouldn't have to leave your house. The world would be the door, be the path to your door. You wouldn't have to go anywhere. You'd be a millionaire right away. Folks, they're phonies. Fakes, liars. I tried them that found, said they were apostles, and I found them to be liars, liars, liars. Not the words of me, but thus saith the Lord. And Paul said the Lord didn't take it away, but he did something else. He gave me grace that I'd be able to bear it. And he said in verse 9, I call your attention to the words again, my grace is sufficient for thee. For a few minutes, I want to bring a message on the sufficiency of God's grace. The sufficiency of God's grace. Paul, or Peter writes and says that we're to be good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Somebody said grace is everything for nothing for those who don't deserve anything. And that's what grace is. Somebody said, I believe it was Spurgeon one time, a man may have too much money or too much honor. Two things that most of us have never had any problem with having too much of. Very few of us have ever had too much money or too much honor, but he can never have too much of the grace of God. God's grace here is said to be sufficient for him. God's grace is said to be sufficient for Paul. And tonight I want to look at this text and some other scriptures that tell us of the sufficiency of God's grace. The first thing that I'd like to say is that God's grace is sufficient to save any sinner. Aren't you glad for that tonight? Aren't you glad that God's grace is sufficient to save any sinner? I'm telling you tonight, if we ever need to learn something, we need to learn this truth right here, that the grace of God is sufficient to save any sinner, no matter who they are and what they've done. So many times we leave someone and say, they're too hard or they're too wicked or they went too far or they become gospel hardened. Shame on you, pity on you. Aren't you glad somebody didn't say that about you? Aren't you glad somebody didn't give up on you? Aren't you glad somebody didn't quit on you? Some of you were some of the hardest headed, hearted, hearted people that ever lived. But they keep on coming. Christians kept on praying. Preachers kept on praying. And thank God tonight, the grace of God is sufficient to save any sinner. Paul said in Titus, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. I'm glad tonight to know that God's grace is sufficient to save any sinner. Thank God for the message that we have. Thank God for a message as big as God himself that says, go into the world, tell them, my grace is sufficient to save them. My grace has appeared to all men. No matter how wicked they are, God's grace is sufficient to save them. Some of you here tonight that are saved, aren't you glad God's grace is sufficient for you? Aren't you glad that God's grace is sufficient to reach over in the pits of sin and iniquity, in the mire that you're sinking down and lift you up and plant you on a solid rock, establish you going and put a song in your mouth. Thank God tonight for the grace of God. It's able to reach down and get an old dope addict and save him and make him a new creature in Christ Jesus. Thank God for the grace of God tonight. It's able to take some of you old drunks, sober you up, give you a new heart, a new mind, a new life. Thank God for the grace of God tonight. Well, thank him, thank him, thank him for what he's done for me. Bless God, I'm glad that we got a grace that no matter how far in sin a man's went, God's grace is sufficient to save him. No matter how far he's went from God, God's grace is sufficient to save him. No matter how vile, 
no matter how wicked, no matter how low, God's able to save from the uttermost to the guttermost. Praise his holy name. Oh, I'm glad for that. Amen. Man, I can go to the jail and say, I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've been. I don't care how black your past is. God's grace is able to save you. I can go to the hospital and see him dying and on death's door listen to a life of sin and say I've been wicked and I've got a gospel that says the grace of God is sufficient to save. Paul said that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry I've received of the Lord Jesus to testify, to testify of the grace of God. That's what God wants us to do. All of you tonight that are here that are saved you are a testimony to the saving grace of God. Amen. I'm glad for God's grace. I'm glad for God's grace that reached from the bottom of heaven. And in 1963, saved my dad, 37 years old, and it wasn't long till that, until that grace just ran on around there and grabbed a hold of me too. Amen. God's grace sufficient to save any sinner. The Bible said, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. A verse that we quote many times. But it says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Homosexual, there's hope for you. But only hope in the marvelous grace of God. Amen. Pervert, there's hope for you. But only in the marvelous grace of God. No panic, there's hope for you. But only in the marvelous grace of God. Man. Let me tell you, this thrills my soul to know that I've got a God that says my grace has Amen. appeared to all men. Doesn't that bless your heart? Amen. Oh, I tell you, I was getting ready to this message, and I'm looking around in the Bible for verses on grace. And I got over in Romans, and what I did, I nearly got excited over there. <laughs> you never got excited, did you? Well, I don't either. I'm just real calm, slow fella, never do it much. The Bible says... Romans 5, moreover the law entered that the offense might abound. That's true. The Bible said God gave the law that the offense might abound. The law was given so we could see how sinful we really are. The law was given not as a standard for you to live by and try to go to heaven. The law was given so you could see how rotten you were. You want to see how wicked you are? You don't have to go far. Just read the Ten Commandments. Bless your heart, there isn't one person in this building that will honestly get by the first one. Yeah, amen, Brother Jim, that's right. Nobody ever loved God with their whole heart, soul, and mind all the time. Nobody in here, me included. He said the law entered that the offense might abound. I said, yeah. And I read, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. I said, woo! That is good. i got to tell that to somebody else. Wherever sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And thank God, no matter how high your sins mounted up, the grace of God abounded over them and beyond them and around them. How good it is to know God's grace is sufficient to save any sinner. May we believe it tonight. May we not only believe it, but may we put it in practice in our life. The songwriter says, marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater and all our sin. Amen. How good it is to see the grace of God in action. We've seen it in our own lives when God saved us. His grace was manifested in our lives. And listen, some of you had a lot of abounding to do for the grace of God. Amen? Some of your sins had mounted up pretty high. Say amen. All right? Amen. That's right. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. And, but it's good, it's good to see God's grace save somebody and change them, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, I mean, it's a blessing. I preached a funeral and some of my relatives were there. I tried to witness to a bunch of them. None of them got saved. A bunch of sorry dudes. I tried to tell them about the Lord. They wouldn't listen. Wouldn't do a thing. 
I came home, I was about half mad at God. I was. Now, don't look at me so pie, you know. You got mad at God plenty of times. You ain't got the guts to say it, amen? I got about halfway put out with him. I said, I claimed all the promises. I said, I prayed, I wept, I begged, I did everything. I became all things that I might win them. I said, didn't none of them get saved. I'll tell you, I was discouraged. I was moping around. Sunday afternoon, somebody called me on the phone, Brother McGahee. Yes, I'd like to make an appointment with you to talk to you. All right, what do you want to talk? Here's somebody want to counsel. I'd like to see you about 6.30. Okay, see you at your church tonight. They came in there. This fellow came in. He said, "Ah, I'd never, I'd seen him there, but I didn't really know him in church. He said, I'm so-and-so. And he said, I've been coming to this church on and off for about three months. Been coming with this lady, so-and-so. I said, that's good. And he said, I, I wanted to come and talk to you tonight. I said, okay, I figured that. That's why we were there talking. And I, <clears throat> he said, uh, well, I want my, this lady's been talking, you know, going on and on. And he said, well, really what it is is I want to get saved. And he said, what I want to know is can you show me how to get yeah. saved? Can I show you how to get saved? Bless God, I could take one of them about every minute. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah for the grace of God that went out and hunted that sinner, sought him and called me and made an appointment to get saved. God didn't save my loved ones, but bless God, he saved somebody else. He said, I've been a Roman Catholic all of my life, but I never heard about being saved until I come here. I began to show him verses in the Bible. He said, I already seen that. I just want to get saved. I said, do you believe the Bible? He said, I told you I believe the Bible. I just want to get saved. I said, do you know what to do to get saved? He said, preacher, I told you I know what to do to get saved. I know where the verses are. I'll turn to them and show them to you if you want me to. I just want to get saved. Hallelujah for the grace of God. Grace, marvelous grace, amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. God's grace is sufficient to save any sinner. Not only that, you need to realize that God's grace is sufficient to strengthen the weakest Christian. I'm glad for that tonight. I'm glad for that. We're going to put this verse to the test tonight. He said, my grace is sufficient for thee. Dr. Ruckman brought some things out on this the other night, real good. I never tried to improve or add to or do anything to anything that he said. But he said it's a hard verse. And you know, a lot of verses we just read over and over again to never really sink in. We call ourselves Bible believers. We are in principle, but are we in practice? Yeah, you can believe all about it. Listen, I believe the King James Bible is the Word of God. I believed it was before I got saved, since I've been saved, as long as I've been saved until I get home to heaven. I know that this book is the Word of God. No mistakes, no errors, no contradictions, and bless your little pea-picking hearts, no problems whatsoever. I tire of these men that say, I don't believe it has contradictions, but I do believe it has a problem. Bless God, the problem's not the book, the problem with you, you old rascal problem's not with this book. It's perfect. It's without error. It's without fault. It's as Jesus was. He did no sin. Neither was guile in his mouth. His mouth spoke the word of God. The beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. To find a mistake in the Bible is like to find a sin in the life of Jesus. It is an utter impossibility. Yeah, I can't get going on that. I can't do that. This verse says, my grace is sufficient for thee. That grace is sufficient to strengthen the weakest Christian. Now here's one of these things in the Bible that seems to be or is what we call a paradox. Look what Paul says at the end of verse 10. When I am weak, then am I strong. Well, that don't sound like, that don't sound right, does it? You see that? When I am weak, then am I strong. I don't sound right. How could you be weak and be strong at the same time? Doesn't sound right, does it? Look at it. I'll be honest. You just read that. You're as dumb as I am. You know, you're as dumb as some people. I met a woman the other day. She thought Easter Sunday was Billy Sunday's sister. That's how dumb that <laughs> she was. Some about as dumb as that. But what are you saying, Paul? He said, I'll tell you what. 
The reason I take pleasure in my infirmities and my reproaches and my persecutions is because every time these things come, I get a real good look at my old rotten flesh. And when these things come, this old flesh gets weak and it wants to give up. And when this flesh gets weak, I run to God, trust in God, and lean on God, and then am I strong. Weak physically, but strong spiritually. Why? Persecutions come, afflictions come, trouble, infirmities, rot, nick his whole body and knock it down. The more that this flesh is tested, the more we see how rotten it really is. The more we see that we cannot trust it, we cannot rely on it, we cannot depend on it. And Paul said, I saw that. I saw it. And I said, Lord, if you won't take it away, God, help me. And God said, my grace is sufficient for thee. I tell you, one of the greatest lessons you'll ever learn as a Christian is that our sufficiency is of God. It's not ourself, not your brains. God could take your brain and just snap it just like that. Our sufficiency is not of us. We put no confidence in the flesh. God, God, the weakest Christian is strong through the grace that God gives. Now, do you believe the Bible? You believe it? Say amen. Yeah. Right, my grace is sufficient for thee. Whatever, as a Christian, you ought to do, you can do by the grace of God. A lot of people have said, I can't do this. You're probably right. You can't do it. But God can do it through you. I've heard a lot of people say, Brother Jim, I've tried and I can't. Well, quit trying and quit you trying and let God try. I like Moses. I like a lot of people in the Bible, but I like him too. I went over and seen him the other day and visited with him. Talked to him a little bit. He talked to me more than I talked to him. And I can kind of relate to Moses, and I'll tell you why. I went up there. The Lord said, uh, Moses, he said, I got something I want you to do. So I want you to go up here and take a message to Pharaoh. Moses said, Lord, he said, you know, I, I'm not eloquent. He said, boy, I can't talk. I can't speak. I can't do anything. The Lord said, you go. He said, they're not going to listen. The Lord said, I'm the one that made your mouth. I'm the one that made you. And he said, you just go and tell them that I am sent you. Moses said, now listen, I'll go, but i got to have somebody do the talking for me. So Aaron, Aaron's supposed to do all the talking. Remember reading your Bible? Remember that? I mean, Aaron's going, Moses, Moses is going to tell him, he said, now Aaron, tell him this, and Aaron, tell him, see. And you read that next chapter, and it says, and they said to Pharaoh, and they said to Pharaoh, but it wasn't long till where in the world did Aaron go? Aaron ain't nowhere to be found. Moses up there saying, Pharaoh, but you better let my people go. What was it? I'll tell you what. Moses got up there and realized that he could not speak. So the grace of God could enable him to speak. I have been, since I was a teenager, afraid to speak in front of people. Afraid. I really have. When I was in school, I'll, a confession good for the soul, when I was in school, Rather than give an oral book report, you know what that is? That's not too hard, is it? Oral book report. You talk, say what's in the book, tell them. And rather than do that, I'd take an F. I mean, 25 or 30 people, I was scared. I mean, I was literally scared to death to get up and look at people. Lockjaw. I got it, bud. I mean, I had it. Teacher called my name, James, and she never could pronounce it. Never been in school in my life where a teacher could look at my name and pronounce it. Don't laugh. Some of you couldn't pronounce it now if you had to either. It took me 12 years to learn how to spell it. I know it was for you. Going to do it? No, I'll take an F. God saved me and God called me to preach. The night he called me to preach, I said, now, I got to talk to you. And I went up on a hill and stayed up there all night long. I'm going to say, I'll tell you something, Lord. I'm scared to death. I can't speak in front of people. I can't talk. I gave him every excuse and every alibi that you can imagine. You know what he told me? He said, Jim, as long as you realize you can't do it and you trust me, then you'll be able to do it. I'm here tonight not because, listen, this ain't Jim McGahee. 
This isn't old Jim McGahey. I know the old Jim McGahey. He is a chicken. I'm here tonight because of the grace of an almighty God. The Bible said, And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Paul said to Timothy, Be thou therefore, my son, be strong. Be strong in the grace that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Gypsy Smith said one time, he went to a little church out in a little village to perform a wedding ceremony. He said didn't know where it was at or what size of a church, but he said they had asked an organist to come and play the organ. And he said the organist was one of the most gifted organists that he had ever known in his life. So he could just make the organ literally sing. And he said when he played it, he said it was just a sweet melody. You'd think God opened up the portals of heaven. And he said when we got to that little church, there was an organ over in the corner, all dusty, broken down, one of them old pump organs. All the pedals didn't work. The keys didn't work. And he said the organist came and looked at it. Gypsy Smith said, I felt sorry for the organist. I told him, I said, listen, I, I didn't know what they had or what was going on here. But he said, this is their organ. I don't know whether you want to play it or not. The organist said, I'll play it. And Gypsy Smith said when that wedding began, he began to play, and he said, I couldn't believe the music was coming out of that organ. He said, that man was such a master playing the organ that he could take an old broken down thing and make sweet music come out of it. And Gypsy Smith said, I backed off and said, God, that's why you've been able to use me. You've taken an old broken down sinner whose pedals wasn't working right and the keys wasn't all there and it, I was dusty and broken down but the master of the universe took his lovely hands and played and brought out a beautiful song. Let the one who planted the lilies, let the one who put the smell in the rose, the color in the rainbow, let the master of the universe touch your life and a beautiful song will come out. God's grace is sufficient to strengthen the weakest Christian. Let's put it to the test. God's grace is sufficient to sustain under any circumstance. Now what's it say? My grace is sufficient for thee. You believe that? Amen. You said you believed it. You committed yourself. Some of you did anyway. Some of you wouldn't commit yourself. I know that. That's all right. My grace is sufficient for thee. Now what, what else? Is, nothing. Nothing. No ands, yes, buts, no added to taken away. Do we believe it or don't we? You want me to tell you? Let me tell you something. Our problem is we believe works for everybody else except our circumstance. You know what that is? That's a pity party. Did you ever have one? Whoa, it's me. It's a pity party. You sit around and pity yourself. God, I believe you're real. God, I believe you're God. I believe you've got grace and power. I believe you can change a sinner, strengthen a Christian. But God, you just don't really know about what I'm going through. My circumstances are so different than anybody else. Don't bet on it. If the Bible is true, and I have no doubt in my mind, it says there hath no temptation taken, man, such as common. What you're going through, somebody else has went through. I've got good news for you tonight. No matter the circumstances, God's grace is sufficient. No matter how black the future may look, God's grace is sufficient. No matter how big the problem, God's grace is sufficient. This audience this size, there's more problems than this little preacher could ever imagine. As I look out across you, this audience tonight, some of you got problems with your kids. Some problems of the wife, the husband, the mother, the father, loved ones, and relatives, heartaches, heartbreaks. Man that is born of woman is but few days and full of trouble. It's true, true. Life at its best is a veil of tears. I got good news for you. God's grace is sufficient to sustain you under any circumstance. I'm glad 
bless God that we got something that works. I like things that work, don't you? I don't like something that don't work. Washing machine don't work, throw it away. Get rid of it. Get out of here, amen? I mean, maybe not you. You know, I, I, Dr. Ruffin, he's taught on demon possession for a long time. I take it farther than he does, really. I think washing machines can be demon possessed. <laughs> I know one thing, curtain rods are for sure. <laughs> yes. Bless God, I'll tell you, they have tried my patience many a time. No doubt about car motors. They've been demon-possessed for a long time. You ever hear them try to cough them out? <laughs> Did you ever hear them? All of us have come to the point in our life where we said, I can't go another step. I can't go another day. All of us have fell on our face at a time. Listen, didn't know what to pray. I've come to times in my life where I was absolutely empty. I've got on my knees and on my face to pray and couldn't do nothing but cry because I didn't even know how to pray. I didn't know whether to ask this or that or this or that. I said, Lord, it's just too much for me. You do it. Whatever you think is right, do it. But God, 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 just give me the grace to sustain it and to go on for thee. I'm glad tonight that God's grace. The Bible says we have great high priest. Oh, you ought to read about him, amen. You ever get down, just trip over to Hebrews and get on that high priest, amen. I'll tell you, he'll lift your spirits. The Bible said this great high priest, not like others, but he's touched with the feeling and infirmities. The Bible said having such a great high priest, listen now, let us therefore come boldly under the throne of what? Grace. We may obtain mercy find what? Grace to help in time of need. I got looking at this thing and you know I got thinking about grace. You ever read Paul's epistles? You know what they start with? Grace be unto you and peace from the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and mercy be unto you. And you know what they close with? The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. You know what Paul's saying to those Christians? You are going to need the grace of God. Amen. That's why he says, grace be unto you, grace be unto you, grace from our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. My friend, it is not vain repetition, but divine inspiration from the hand of Paul to tell us that if there's one thing we need to possess and to get all we can, that is the marvelous, infinite, matchless grace of God. Amen. There's many here tonight we would not be here if it were not for the grace of God. If it wasn't for the grace of God, we'd be dead and in hell right now. Not in hell, we'd be in some hospital bed or some prison or some psycho ward. Were it for not for the grace of God. Boldly to the throne. I read not long ago of John Patton, the great missionary to the New Hebrides. Christian people need to read church history and they need to read about the life of great missionaries and preachers of old. You're ignorant. Most Christians are ignorant because they don't know anything about their heritage whatsoever. I had to do you good to find out. John Patton went through many hardships, many things to get to the New Hebrides and got there, him and his wife, set up a little house and found out they were going to have a little baby, and they did. He was so glad that he had got to the mission field, so glad that his wife was there and that she'd given birth to a new baby. But his joy was short-lived because in just a few days, his wife died and his baby died. In the New Hebrides, with not a friend, no one to turn to, he said, I dug my own wife, my own baby's grave. I prepared my wife and my baby for the grave, put them in the grave, and covered them up. Oh, you think you've got problems? Shut up. You got no problems. Christian, I mean, we, we have no problems whatsoever compared to that. With his own hands to dig the grave for his wife and his own baby. You know what he said in his diary? If it hadn't been for Jesus, his fellowship, 
and the grace of God, I'd have sat down beside that grave and went crazy, or I would have died in grief. You hear what I said? He said if it wasn't for Jesus and His grace, I'd have sat down beside of that grave and either went crazy or died because of grief. He got up, went on, became one of the greatest men that this earth has ever known, literally. How did he do it? God's grace. God's grace accepted is God's peace experienced. And that's where it's at, my friend. The grace of God is sufficient. Last of all, it's sufficient to safely deliver us home. The same grace that saves us, the same grace that satisfies us, the same grace that strengthens and sustains is able to safely deliver us home. I'm glad tonight that I'm saved by the grace of an almighty God. I'm glad I don't have to worry about losing it. Amen. Dr. Ruckman said something the other morning. Man, it just hit me. It's simple. Of course, I pick up on simple stuff. That's what I am. He said, if you could lose it, you would. Amen. Man. You better say amen, bud. Honey, you better say amen, because if you could lose it, you would. You would have already lost it. Amen. I'm glad that we're not kept by our power, by the grace of God. Ephesians said, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. By grace are you saved through faith. I want you to know some people are not saved by grace. They're saved by grease. They slide in and out all of their life. In one day, out the next day. They've got a salvation that's a greasy salvation, you see. But I'm glad that I'm saved by grace. He said, my grace is sufficient for thee. When a man named John Selden was dying, who was a wealthy and learned man, the preacher came by his bedside. And when he did, he looked up at the preacher and said, I've surveyed most of the learning that there is in this life. And he had... He had a library that contained over 8,000 volumes. He had read every one. He said, I have studied something about almost everything in this world in any field of learning that you can mention. I've studied it. But he said, as I lay here dying, knowing that I'm going to meet my maker, he says, there is but one book that brings me any comfort and peace, and that's the Word of God. He said, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. I'm glad tonight for the grace of God. An old Christian woman lay dying. And as time had went by, her children and loved ones had died, and she had to spend her last few days in the poorhouse. And in the poorhouse one day, her doctor, who had been her doctor most of her life, came in and examined her. She was feeling bad. He looked up at the doctor the doctor, I'm going to die. You know, doctors, they're supposed to be cool. They can't tell you I'm going to die. I mean, they don't get paid as much money if they didn't put big words and all that stuff in there. He could, you know, I mean, you, you know, you're going to die. He just couldn't say that. He said, well, he said, ma'am's not looked at She looked up at him and said, now listen, sonny. I've been knowing you, and you've been knowing me too long to beat around the bush. I'm dying, ain't I? He still wouldn't say it. He kind of him hauled around. He said, well, he said, the thing's... Don't get better and this doesn't happen. It looks like a possibility. She said, glory to God. When he did, he kind of backed off and did a double take again. He said, what was it that you said? She said, glory to God. He said, would you explain to me how you, dying in a poorhouse, no money, possessions, or friends, can say glory to God? He said, well, doctor, if you was moving from a poorhouse to the mansion wouldn't you say glory to God too one day we'll make the final move that we'll ever make from this old poorhouse to the mansion and God said my grace is sufficient for me let's bow our heads there's a poem 
It's been a blessing to me many a times, and I hope it is to you. It says, when sin stained, burdened and weary, from bondage I long to be free. Then came to my heart a sweet message. My grace is sufficient for thee. Though tempted and sadly discouraged, my soul to this refuge will flee and rest in the blessed assurance. My grace is sufficient for thee. O Lord, I would press on with courage, though rugged the pathway may be, sustained and upheld by the promise, my grace is sufficient for thee. Soon, soon the warfare will be over. My Lord, face to face, I shall see and prove as I dwell in his presence. My grace is sufficient for thee. Lost one, if you're here tonight without Jesus, I've got good news for you. I've got the best news that you've ever heard. God's grace is sufficient to save you. You say, preacher, you don't know what I've done and where I've been. I didn't make the promise. God did. God knows everywhere you've been. He knows every sin you've committed. You know what he says? My grace is sufficient. Christian, are you weak? Are you trembling? Are you fearful? Good news. God's grace is sufficient. Some of you tonight, the load is heavy. No, oh, I know the load can get so heavy. And I know that you can come to times in your life where you just cry out to God and say, Lord, if you don't do something, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to go on. Thank God you're here tonight. Thank God he's brought you this far. And I'll tell you how you got here. By the grace of an almighty God. One day, we step on heaven's shore. Sing the songs and praise. And what we're going to sing is praises to his name. Thank you for what he's done. Father, bless the word of God tonight. Lord, you have laid this message upon my heart for someone, somebody that's here tonight. I don't know who it is, Lord. And I pray that through the word of God, they've been strengthened, they've been helped, they've been encouraged, they've been comforted. Lord, I want to help. I don't want to, I, I don't want to waste time. I don't want to mess around. I don't want to play church. And I, I don't want to come up here, Lord, with the idea of just getting up here and preaching a message. I want to get up here, Lord, with the idea of helping someone. And Lord, may this book, through your Holy Spirit, help the people that are here tonight. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>